Hello. Uh, today I'm going to give a talk, an introduction to digital filter design. This is a follow-up talk to uh, another recorded talk that I gave called Introduction to Digital Filters. The sources in this talk are exactly the same. Almost everything is coming from Julius Smith in his text Introduction to Digital Filters, and a lot more is also coming from Spectral Audio Signal Processing. Also relevant is his other book, Physical Audio Signal Processing, Maynard Mueller's book, The Fundamentals of Music Processing, and the kind of large reference textbook by Alan Oppenheim and Ronald Schaefer, Digital Signal Processing. So compared to last time, uh, the other talk, I talked about how to analyze a filter that's been given to you. In this talk, we're going to look at uh, one of the issues that comes up when you try to build a filter yourself that does a given thing. So our goal for this talk is to build a low-pass filter. And the ideal for this is to have some uh, amplitude response to your filter. So you want your filter to multiply on the Fourier side by one for low frequencies. This is on the Fourier side at frequency k. You want to leave low frequencies alone, multiply them by one, and set all the other frequencies past some critical frequency threshold to zero. So just stated a little more concretely, the way that we want this guy to act is it sends an input signal x, remembering that x is a, uh, a sequence of numbers representing the amplitude of a function, or amplitude of uh, like a song, sound wave. So it takes x as an input and it spits out, take the Fourier transform of x, multiply by this h hat function, and then take the Fourier inverse of the whole thing. Okay, and then what this is doing, or simplifying this, we can write this as h involved with x, where h is the Fourier inverse of whatever function we put here. So if we take our function h to be uh, the same as the magnitude, so if we don't put any complex phase on it, we just take the Fourier inverse transform of this guy, what we find is the sync function, which is some uh, multiple of sine x over x. It's, uh, it's like a Dirichlet kernel type thing. And this is not a good filter for a number of reasons. I'm going to state two of them here. And in this talk, we're going to talk about only one of the problems with this. So first kind of immediate problem is that this is infinitely long, it has infinite support, uh, which is kind of a problem because we need things to be finite if we're going to do them on a computer in the real world. We're not going to talk about that. What we will talk about is the other problem with this, is that it's non-causal, meaning that if this h is our convolution kernel, then in order to find uh, the output at a given time, you need to see all the inputs from all future times. And for a lot of applications, you don't want that to be the case. You would like to be able to give an output function that depends only on your current input and some of the recent past inputs. Okay, so that's going to be the focus of this talk on what makes a filter non-causal and how to make it causal. Because um, so far we've designed kind of half of our filter. We've defined what the amplitude response, the Fourier magnitude should be. We have uh, a degree of freedom in determining what the phase should be, what the complex phase of this function should be. And hopefully we can uh, modulate that or change that in such a way that we get something that's causal. Uh, before I go on, I'm going to make a remark. That's not particularly relevant if you're new to this subject, but if you know things about this subject, then 
uh, this will be like some kind of idiosyncrasy in the talk, is that, or actually, before, before making the remark, let me make a definition. So a definition will say, a filter is causal if it's support or if it's convolution kernel in the time domain has non-positive support. Okay, and a remark about this. So in the digital signal processing literature, um, let me say, convolution kernel H of a filter is often uh, switched for or let me say switched around with what's called the impulse response of a filter. which is h convolved with a delta function. This is what happens when you put an impulse through your filter. Uh, and the reason this is sometimes confusing is because if your convolution kernel looks like this, if this is h, then h convolved with a delta function, when you pass uh, uh, a unit impulse through, you see uh, the negative of that. So this is equal to h of minus the input. Uh, and probably it's because I'm just not reading very carefully, but throughout the literature, uh, these two are kind of used interchangeably, and it often makes for some confusing situations where you expect to have all positive support or all negative support or whatever. Obviously, both of these uniquely determine the filter. Um, but this is kind of a heads up for this talk that I might make a bunch of mistakes where I'm, I'm claiming that something has negative support but actually it has positive support. This is uh, one of the sources of those mistakes. There are probably, of course, going to be other ones. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to try to stick to the uh, convolution kernel representation of a filter. Okay, so on to the topic at hand. Uh, the first main question that we're going to answer what makes a filter non-causal? And I'll look at this through a series of examples. First, this kind of trivial example where we just take the sum of the current input and the next input. So this is let me rewrite this as h convolved with x, where h looks like this. It's 1 here, 1 here, 0 elsewhere. There's h in the time domain. Uh, this is, I'm going to say, a trivial or removable non-causality because we can rewrite h as a causal part convolved with a shift operator. and then convolved with x, where the causal part of h is this one that looks at the current input and, the, and one input behind, and then the shift operator, so here's h causal, and the shift operator just moves everything forward. So this is kind of not the non-causality that we're concerned with. This is somehow an artificial uh, non-causality. I'll call it 
removable. Non-causality. Okay. Uh, where we're going to get more substantial non-causal problems happening is when we introduce a feedback term. So when, when we have some y n minus 1 floating around on the other side. And before we get to a bad example, let me give a good example. Okay, so this is very similar to our previous filter. Take the current sample, half of the last input sample, and half of the last output sample. And I can iterate this, I can expand uh, y through this definition, and if I were to do so, infinitely, you know, go kind of go all the way down, so to speak, sparing you the details, we get a geometric series in the terms of x. And if our input signal x is bounded, which it always is, then this converges just fine. There's no problem with this. Uh, and it makes perfect sense to define our output in, in this way. OK, so this is stable feedback. So now on to the bad example. If instead I take the same filter, but I add twice the last output, now this is going to be bad because when I expand, when I iterate this guy, um, what do I get? I'm going to get 2xn minus 1 plus, yeah, right? Plus, yeah, plus xn minus 2 plus 4 xn minus 2 plus 2 xn minus 3, and so on. Now I have uh, a geometric growth in the coefficients of these guys, which of course does not converge. And so this is bad. This is uh, unstable feedback. And So one thing that we can do to kind of fix this problem is by algebraic manipulation, let me isolate this yn minus 1 here. So if I do that, I get minus xn minus 1 half xn minus 1 plus yn all divided by 2. Now the coefficient on this feedback term um, is a half, which is nice. We have a geometric uh, geometric decrease again. But now I'm going forwards in time. So if I, if I iterate this, I get minus xn over 2, let me write, minus a half xn minus a quarter xn minus 1, minus a half uh, minus a quarter xn plus 1 minus an eighth xn minus an eighth xn plus 2 minus a sixteenth xn plus 1 and so on. Okay, and now this is this is converging nicely but we're looking forwards in time. So, unstable feedback is stable anti-causal feedback. Let me highlight these guys. So, unstable feedback is stable but anti-causal feedback. And then the picture for this 
I highlight this as well. The picture for this is that feedback terms in the time domain give us uh, a geometric growth or a geometric series in, in one direction or the other. So for this example, we have a stable feedback. And our curve is going to look like this. And what we see is, the, is this green part, this uh, causal geometric decrease in, in the coefficients of the terms. Meanwhile, for, for this filter, we have this kind of geometric curve, where now this unstable feedback term is this which is causal, but it's uh, blowing up in magnitude. And our stable anti-causal term looks like this. OK. So there's the picture. And then uh, natural question task. So question, why do we see the stable part? of this curve. So evidently, when we prescribe something on the Fourier side, and then we take the Fourier inverse, we get something that uh, is not blowing up, of course. We get a bunch of uh, decaying terms. Some of them are uh, causal decaying terms. Some of them are non-causal decaying, uh, anti-causal decaying terms. But we only see the decaying terms. We never see the unstable part uh, of this. And so the question is kind of why does that why does that happen? How does that manifest? And in order to answer that, we're going to pass to the uh, the Z transform to the Z domain. And qualitatively look at both of these two example filters. So briefly, recall that the Z transform of some input function little x is defined by this power series, this kind of generating function thing, where we have an input, which is our discretely defined function. We get as an output our complex uh, function of the variable Z, capital X. Okay. So let's take the Z-transform of both of these filters. So sparing you the details, we get Y of Z. We get this. So this is our transfer function this uniquely uh, characterizes the filter that we're that we're applying here if we look at a picture of what this filter looks like in the z domain we have a zero over here at negative a half and we have a pole here at positive a half okay now let's give the same treatment to the other filter, below the, the badly behaved one. When we take the Z-transform and rearrange things, um, what do we get here? We get one minus two. Okay, and now the picture of this guy in the z domain, and just plotting this transfer function here, 
we have a zero at negative a half, but now a pole at two. And so what's happening is if we have a prescribed um, Fourier magnitude, that's prescribing the Fourier transform along here, right? In the z domain, our, our, the, uh, <coughs> the Fourier transform of our function lives on the unit circle. And so if I want to invert uh, my function that's living here in such a way that I have prescribed values here, then I need the unit circle to be in my radius of convergence. I, I have a pole here that I need to avoid, and so I need to define a domain of convergence that avoids this pole, but includes the unit circle. <coughs> and in this case, I can do that by taking the, uh, the complement of a circle here. So this is my domain. And when I take the, uh, the inverse of this, I get a Laurent series entirely in terms of z inverse. So I have no positive powers of z. It's all uh, an order zero term, uh, z inverse, z to the minus two, z to the minus three, because, because I've chosen my domain to be uh, this shape. Meanwhile, here, if I need to avoid this pole, but include the unit circle, then I'm forced to take a domain like this for my, my convergence region. And when I do this, my Laurent series, or just regular Maclaurin series, and I need to do this series, that's, it basically comes from when you take the inverse Z transform, which is completely analogous. So completely analogous to the Fourier inverse, you just put a, a positive sign here. So my Laurent series, when I have this region of convergence, is entirely in terms of positive z. So I have an order zero term. Order z, z squared, z cubed. And these, of course, okay, so, so z inverse corresponds to a time delay, right? This, this n minus one, z, z to the minus two corresponds to taking two time steps ago. Um, and so this is nice, this is a causal series. When you take the inverse z transform of this guy, this is causal. When you take the inverse z transform of this, it's entirely anti-causal because powers of z correspond to shifts forwards in time. So the moral of the story is that if you want to have a convergent, if you want to have a causal sequence or a causal filter, you need to have the poles of your z transform lie inside the unit circle. Write it here. So the moral is causal filters have zeros inside the unit, the unit circle. Okay, so now that we've figured that out, now that we understand why uh, a filter is non-causal, there's a very easy fix to this problem. So, oh, did I say zeros? I meant poles. You need to have your, your poles inside the unit circle. And hopefully this blue shows up. Okay. So, how to fix bad poles? Turns out there's a very easy fix. Um, so let's say that Here's your z transform. Let's say you have a pole here at the complex number c. So your filter, or your transfer function for your filter, 
is some lower order filter or some base filter H naught times a pole at C. Then the trick that we're going to use is we're going to reflect this through the circle. So this, we're going to replace the pole here with a pole here at C conjugate inverse. Um, and algebraically, this means multiplying the top and bottom by Z minus C conjugate inverse. Uh, and now we're in business because this has the pole fixed and this, it turns out, is a very nice term. This has constant norm 1, or uh, sorry, not norm 1, constant norm 1 over norm C. So I can make it even a little bit nicer by multiplying by uh, 1 over C or 1 over C conjugate, whichever I like. So if I write it like this, where now I've just multiplied the top and bottom by C conjugate, then this has my pole fixed, and this is constant norm 1. Meaning this is a purely phase term. And if you recall, kind of, the problem that we're given, the thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with a filter that has a given magnitude and we're free to pick the phase however we want. So adding this phase term doesn't hurt us. Or in other words, if we, instead of using this h of z, if we instead just chop off this part and use this part, then this is nice because it has the same magnitude and the pole is now inside the unit circle. So we fix that. Uh, and so we can just repeat this over and over again for all the poles in our filter and we come up with, in the end, a causal filter with the same uh, Fourier magnitude. Okay, so end of story. Great. Well, not quite, because there are more things that I want to talk about. In particular, or at least next, I'm going to talk about what happens when we do the poles as well. So, or sorry, the zeros. What happens when we flip the zeros inside the unit circle? Flipping the poles inside makes us causal. Flipping the zeros inside, it turns out, uh, is also something nice that we might want to do, or at least understand. Let's do the zeros too. So, a definition. We call a filter minimum phase if um, all its poles and zeros. are inside the unit circle. And the first thing that I'm going to do is explore uh, what is meant by this term minimum phase. And to do so, first I'm just going to state a fact, not prove it, but you can kind of think of an argument yourself. It's certainly a believable fact. The only causal filters with fixed Fourier magnitude um, are obtained by
flipping zeros inside and outside of the unit circle. So in other words, if you already have one causal filter, then uh, the action of flipping zeros inside and outside the unit circle is transitive on this group of, of filters or whatever. Okay, uh, in other words, so IE there are uh, two to the number of zeros such filters. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to give a full argument for why Okay, well, next I'm going to talk about why these guys are minimum phase, and I'm not going to give a full argument for it, but... Okay, so proposition. Well, actually, let me not even state a proposition. Let me just do the, the, the basic calculation. So when flipping a zero and its conjugate inside the unit circle, recall that whenever we have a real valued filter, which uh, for this talk we always do, um, zeros and poles always come in conjugate pairs. So we always have a zero and its conjugate, and when we flip both of them inside the unit circle, what do we get if we have, this is my filter with the zero with uh, zero and its conjugate both outside the unit circle, let's call it some base filter times this and this. There are my two zeros for norm c greater than one. Then how do I flip these inside? I multiply and divide by the uh, conjugate inverses of both of these guys. Again, this is my filter with the same magnitude response, the same Fourier norm, with um, the zeros inside the unit circle. This is norm one, and uh, I just I'm just not going to do the calculation. I'll just tell you, and you'll believe me or go find out for yourself that. This guy here has an argument positive. It, it's some kind of combination of sines and arctans. Looks mostly like an arctan, looks something like this. It's a positive, it has, or sorry, this is the, this is a graph of the argument of this guy. It's increasing. And so when we take the argument, this uh, argument acts like a logarithm, so we get argument of this plus argument of that. This guy's positive, which means this has smaller phase, smaller argument. Um, okay, and, and that's all I'm going to say on that. see this and think, aha, this is why we like minimum phase filters, because uh, they move around the sinusoids as little as possible, which is like maybe a desirable thing. But in fact, this is not uh, as desirable as you might think. 
because when you change the phase of a sinusoid, the actual translate of the function is then multiplied by the frequency that the, that the sinusoid is oscillating at. So if you take a very rapidly oscillating sinusoid and you shift it by half a phase, then you've really shifted the, the actual function very little. Whereas if you have a very slow moving sinusoid and you shift it by half a phase, uh, or shift it by half a period, I mean, you give it a phase shift of half a period, then you, you've translated the function a great deal. Um, so it turns out that, remark, minimum phase is not the best thing to do for preserving waveform. That is, pre for preserving the shape of your input wave. Instead, linear phase filters are best for that. Okay. And the kind of very quick math behind this is that if I give my sinusoid a phase shift that depends on k, then when this phase shift is linear in the frequency, so I set phi of k to be like alpha times k, phi of k equals alpha k, something like that, this gives me sine of k times t plus alpha, which is a pure translation of, of my sinusoid. And this translation is independent of the frequency k. So it would take the whole waveform and shift it over. Uh, and this is, okay, so that, that best preserves the waveform. Here's an example. If we want to make this filter here causal, something that looks like this, let's say it has finite support, then the linear phase uh, the linear phase causal version of this is obtained just by translating the whole function. It turns out when you translate a whole function, you take the Fourier transform of that translate, you get a linear phase, right? You, get, you just get e to the i k times your translate, which, and that's your phase. So my linear phase causal version looks like this. Meanwhile, my Minimum phase, minimum phase version of this of this filter made causal is going to look, uh, and again, this is a cartoon, not very accurate at all, not even qualitatively well. Anyway, my minimum phase version is going to look something like this, and so okay, through this cartoon, what I'm trying to emphasize is that the the kind of good property of minimum phase filters is that they have their energy much more concentrated. Uh, and they're, they're best concentrated towards zero compared to, or better than the, the linear phase. And in fact, this is uh, a more general thing. So proposition, among all causal filters having the same magnitude response, so <clears throat> within the same class of filters that we're talking about, so among all Causal filters with fixed Fourier magnitude minimum phase is not only the one with the the smallest phase the smallest phase shift but uh, minimum phase has the best concentration 
of mass. That is If you have a minimum phase filter uh, and it has the as a function its Fourier magnitude is the same as some other filter for some other filter which is also causal then <clears throat> if you take a partial sum just looking locally near zero at h minimum phase and I'm going to put minus n here just to emphasize that we're looking at negative times now on the time domain this partial sum is greater than or equal to the same partial sum for the other function And uh, immediately, let me remark that by Parseval, by Parseval's theorem, um, this same sum up to infinity. Do I want to say this? Okay. This same sum up to infinity, instead of up to a finite n. Uh, of this quantity, we get the we get equality between the two. This is equal to the sum up to infinity because this is equal to the sum of the the Fourier modes. H bar of n squared. H bar of And because uh, these two both have the same uh, the same Fourier, Fourier magnitude, it means they have the same total L2 mass on the time side. And so this is really saying something concrete about the concentration of mass near time zero. Okay. The proof for this is uh, very similar to this one. We're going to look at what happens when we flip a zero inside the unit circle. And we're going to observe that doing so gives us a better concentration. another piece of chalk. So, proof of that proposition. Moving a zero inside, where am I? I want uh, H outside. This filter is some base filter times a zero outside. filter with the zero moved inside is this base filter with this guy. Okay. And so, uh, if we take the inverse Z transform of these guys, we get the time representation of these two filters, right, minus N. This is H naught 
convolved with multiplication becomes convolution. Z minus C, let me write perversely check for inverse Z transform of this guy. Okay, inverse Z transform of this is not hard to calculate. This guy becomes a shift forwards in time, and this just multiplies by minus C. This is, and again, this is evaluated at time minus N. So this is H naught of minus N plus one minus C H naught of minus N. Okay. And if I do the same, if I get the same treatment for the other one, then what I get is C bar H naught minus N plus one um, minus H naught of minus N. Okay. And Hopefully you will believe me if I tell you that when I sum these h outside of minus n squared minus h inside of minus n squared. Hopefully you'll believe me that when I square this term, I get right this term squared. That'll cancel. Uh, in a telescoping way with when I square this, I get this term squared. Similarly here, I have C, C bar and C become the same when I take norm squared. These terms kind of cancel out, and the cross terms, you'll believe me, kind of work themselves out, and this telescopes in a very nice way to become one minus norm C squared, H naught minus N norm squared. Okay. And this is a positive thing because C is the the uh, what should we do? The zero lives outside the unit circle. This is a negative thing, so this is less than or equal to zero. And that's it because that means that our partial sum of the energy here minus our partial sum of the energy with the zero flipped inside gives us a negative thing. So. That's the full argument. Okay. So that's it for uh, minimum phase filters. Now we kind of understand those. We understand what happens when we flip the zeros inside. It makes us causal. We understand what happened. Oh, sorry. We understand what happens when we flip poles inside the unit circle. It makes us causal. We understand what happens when we flip zeros inside the unit circle. It makes us uh, concentrated towards time zero. So the next thing that I'm going to talk about is kind of a practical consideration that motivates a way to do this in a kind of automated way. So next I'm going to be talking about the Hilbert transform. You might say, uh, okay, we're done. We completely understand how to make things causal, make them concentrated, make them nice. But uh, the fact of the matter is, factoring polynomials is, uh, it's hard. It's computationally difficult. And you would like to not have, not have to do that, basically. <laughs> You'd like something that uh, is kind of a black box that doesn't take uh, increasing amounts of time the more complex the filter you feed into it. And so the next thing that I'm, going to talk, that I'm going to talk about is a way to do that. So the problem is that factoring polynomials is hard. And uh, in a series of steps, I'm going to explain how to come about a causal filter with the same Fourier magnitude in a different way. So definition. Hilbert transform is convolution with 1 over pi t in the Cauchy principal value sense. 
right? So as a convolution kernel, this is badly behaved near uh, zero, and so we understand this in the principal value sense. So here's one over pi t, or uh, okay, and so I'm in the time domain. I'm now denoting it by t. I'm just gonna we've passed to continuous time, so this is kind of a qualitative thing. This isn't super concrete. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to discuss, the way to discretize it, takes some effort. So I'm just going to discuss the, uh, the continuous time mathematics of this. Okay, but anyway, here's my convolution kernel, 1 over pi t. This means that on the Fourier side, <clears throat> uh, and I'll draw this kind of not quite correct cartoon, but anyway, at, uh, for positive frequencies, it's constant i. For negative frequencies, it's constant minus i. And of course, convolution on this side means multiplication on this side, so this operation basically multiplies your Fourier transform by positive i for positive frequencies, negative i for negative frequencies. Okay. Then the way that we're going to use this is if we're given some function x, some function or some function f, then I take f of x, again, just emphasizing that we're in the time domain here. In fact, let me say f of t. We're going to take f of t plus i hf of t. Okay. Uh, so our kind of uh, modification of the function f is to add an imaginary part. And what does this modification do? Well, on the Fourier side, now if I take i times this, the Fourier version of this Hilbert transform, it means I'm multiplying by minus 1 here and plus 1 here, which means that when I add with my original function, I get 0 for positive times, and I'm just multiplying by, multiplying by 2 for negative times. So this has uh, double negative frequencies, or let me say modes. Your, your negative modes are doubled, and it has zero positive modes. All your positive modes are set to zero. Okay. Uh, and this is getting towards what we want. So we wanted to, so now we need to kind of switch the uh, time and frequency domains because we wanted to have our input be something with a, a given Fourier magnitude and our output be something that's uh, zero for positive times. So we want to switch the roles of the time and frequency domains here say, we'll do it again, but on the Fourier side. So again, given some function f that's real valued. Um, make or construct f of k. Uh, and now, because going forwards to the Fourier side is like going negative backwards, okay, well, let, me, let me just say that it's minus i h f of k. The plus i uh, down here turns into a minus i here because when you take two forward Fourier transforms, that's taking the negative of your function. So somehow that's kind of what's going on in the background, where this is turned into a minus sign. But now when we take 
the four, not the Fourier transform, but the Fourier inverse of this guy, we get a filter which is, so this has uh, double negative times and zero positive, positive times, by which I mean um, at negative times your function is just doubled, and at positive times your function is set to zero. In other words, i.e., it's causal. Hooray! And with prescribed Fourier real part. And remark, in fact, it's unique in this sense. So it is the causal filter with prescribed Fourier real part. Uh, and the reason for that is um, when you're, let me write it like this. So if you want to be causal, this means that your even part determines your odd part, or the even part of your function determines the odd part of your function. Because in order for the even and, like, the even and odd parts need to cancel out for all positive times, which means that once you know the even part, the odd part for positive times is determined, and then, of course, the rest of the odd part is determined by being odd. And so this is like one ingredient, and the other ingredient is that um, the real part the Fourier transform goes to the even part. <clears throat> the, or the, that is to say, the Fourier transform takes you back and forth between real part and even part, and takes imaginary part and odd part back and forth. So when you prescribe it to be, uh, when you prescribe the real part of your Fourier transform, when you take the Fourier inverse, that determines the even part of your time domain function. And because you've said that it needs to be causal, the fact that it's causal means that the even part determines the odd part. And so your function is uniquely determined. OK. So this is the only function with, which has the given real part uh, and is causal, given real Fourier part and is causal. Uh, and this is almost what we wanted, so just recall that what we're after is this low-pass filter. And this is the magnitude of our Fourier transform. So the degree of freedom that we have is not the imaginary part, it's the phase. The thing that we prescribe is not the real part, it's the magnitude. And so in order to do that, we're going to do it, we're going to do this construction again <clears throat> but with a logarithm. So, um, now I take log, this is my prescribed function, this is my prescribed Fourier magnitude, is this guy, uh, just norm h hat. I take the logarithm of it, and I subtract, again, i times the Hilbert transform of that same function. So this guy is causal by the way that I've constructed it, uh, causal in the time domain. And because it's causal, that means 
that all of its poles are inside the unit circle. And of course, this isn't the filter that we want. We want a filter that has norm uh, just, just this guy, not with a logarithm. So the way that we go back is by exponentiating. And so because all of our poles are inside the unit circle, when we exponentiate, all poles and zeros are inside the unit circle. Um, remember, like, when you take an exponential of something, the only way that you can get zero is if your input was positive infinity. The only way that you can get uh, a pole is if, oh wait, other way around. When you exponentiate, you get a zero if and only if your input was negative infinity. You get a pole if and only if your input was positive infinity. So after taking, after exponentiating, after taking the exponential, all your poles and zeros are exactly where the poles were of your original function, where the positive infinity poles correspond to uh, new poles and the negative infinity poles correspond to new zeros. Great. In other words, when we exponentiate, we get a minimum phase filter. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, when we exponentiate, log plus i or minus i Hilbert transform. This, <clears throat> this exponential gives me norm h hat e to the minus i Hilbert transform of logarithm of that guy. Great. This is minimum phase, and in particular, causal. So it's a causal filter with the prescribed Fourier magnitude. And we've made the phase so that it's uh, causal. And in fact, better than causal, it's minimum phase. <clears throat> so great, That's, that kind of gives us an algorithm for how to take some input function or some input uh, desired Fourier magnitude and output a causal filter with that Fourier magnitude. You just multiply by this phase. Okay. And that's kind of the end of the story. The last thing that I'm going to mention, this will be the last board that I write on, is how this whole story with the Hilbert transform and this kind of modified function ties into complex analysis. And in particular, it's very pertinent to the Paler-Wiener theorems. Paley-Wiener? Paley-Wiener theorems. So, <clears throat> definition for a function u living in the L2 of the real line. The signal u plus i Hilbert transform of u, and in fact, no, I'll leave it as x, where x is now just a real variable. This guy is called an analytic signal.
Okay. Uh, and the reason this is called an analytic signal is that U and Hilbert transform of U are the boundary values on the real line of conjugate harmonic functions in the upper half plane. Okay, so let me give, let me write a big complex analysis diagram up here. So we have some function u that lives in L2 of the real line. By taking the Poisson transform, this extends the function u by convolving with 1 over pi y over dot squared plus y squared. By convolving with this kernel, we extend u to be something in the upper half plane that's harmonic. Or C plus. Harmonic in the upper half plane. Okay, uh, then kind of on the same level of this, the conjugate harmonic function which I'll call LU, also lives in the upper half plane, it's harmonic in the upper half plane, and then we take boundary value on the real line, we get the Hilbert transform of U, which lives in L2 of the real line as well. Hilbert transform, and this is convolution with 1 over pi dot. Okay, and then living in the middle of this big diagram, if we add these two, one half, we have one half Poisson transform and i over 2 times the conjugate harmonic guy, this function lives in the upper half plane and it's holomorphic there. This is my holomorphic extension, which I can obtain also by um, directly from you by the Cauchy transform. I think, I think this is right. is con convolution with 1 over 2 pi i one over <coughs> dot plus i y. Um, or maybe, maybe it's not the Cauchy transform of u, maybe it's the Cauchy transform of u plus, or half u plus half i h u, not sure on that. Um, but I'll also mention that Okay, here's my whole diagram. This ties in with the Paley-Wiener theorems, which state that uh, the first one, and I'll not write them on the board, I'll just say the first Paley-Wiener theorem, the one that most people know, is the one that says that if you have a function that's compactly supported, then you can extend, you can take the Fourier transform, and that Fourier transform extends to an analytic function in the entire uh, complex space, and it extends to an entire function. If, um, if uh, instead your function is compactly supported on one half, or its support is like, write it as half support, uh, which you should think of as being causal, then it extends to a harmonic function in the upper half plane. Yeah, so now I'm, now I'm thinking more and more that Cauchy transform should be from half this plus i half this. But anyway. Um, the second 
Paley-Wiener theorem, the kind of converse of this is that if you have a function that's holomorphic in the upper half plane, and um, let me say, let me just write this one condition. If your integral, let's say that this function is called f, f of x plus i y dx. So you integrate along a translate of the real line. If your supremum for y greater than 0 is finite, so if you satisfy this condition that, oh, sorry, this should be norm squared, that your energy on, the, on any translate of the real line going upward into the upper half plane is finite, and in fact your supremum over those energies is finite, then your restriction of this guy to the, uh, or, what is it? It's that um, then this guy can be realized as the Fourier transform of a function supported on the positive real axis, or maybe the negative real axis. OK, uh, but I'll say as a reference, if you're interested in more, then if you're interested in exploring these two paley wiener theorems, I'll refer you to Big Root in chapter 19 for a nice discussion of that. Okay, and that's all I have for this talk. Thank you very much for listening.